Now, what do we mean when we say that he or she sure is a character? <laughs> well, we mean that he or she is funny or witty or crazy or different. It means that he or she has some unusual characteristics. Now, character, brethren, is a description of a person's attributes, traits, or abilities. The question for us is, from God's perspective, what is character? How do we develop holy righteous character? Well, you see, godly character involves, first of all, knowing the right from the wrong. That is one thing that we spend our lives learning from a godly perspective, from a biblical perspective, from a biblical basis. After we have sorted out uh, and we know, according to God's word, what is right and what is wrong, it also involves our choice to do that which is right. So, you know, it comes first to the knowledge, then goes to the choice. And then it goes not only from the choice, but then we have to really determine to do that what is right. Speaking of the choice, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 30 and let us remind, be reminded of the choice that God has put before all of us. Indeed, he put that same choice before the house of Israel in the Old Testament. So, again, we need to know what is right and what is wrong. Then we need to have the choice. And then once we choose, we need to do that which is right. <laughs> And it may sound, you know, so simple when I say it like this, but we know all in our practical Christian life that it's not always that easy. In fact, it is sometimes a terrible struggle. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19, God eternal uh, addresses the Old Testament Israel. And he says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, God says, Choose life that both you and your descendants may live. So God has allowed us, you see, brethren, to see what is right and what is wrong, and he wants us to choose life. So we need to know right from wrong. That involves studying God's word, meditating on God's word. Then we choose to do that which is right. Or we can choose to even ignore that little voice that says, no, you shouldn't be doing this because you know it is in the Bible, you know it is right. So you see, second step is we need to choose that which is right. Go to James chapter 1, because in James chapter 1 we'll find the third step, which is do that which is right. James 1 verse 22. But be doers of the word. You see, brethren, because if we only have good intentions and we do not follow through with those intentions, then that is all they are, good intentions. And we haven't done the right thing. You know, we knew what it was we chose in our minds to do the right thing, but we didn't actually do it. Dropped into verse 25. But he who knows, he who looks, rather, into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, meaning continues keeping that law, doing what is right, and is not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, the one, this one, will be blessed in what he does. A doer of the work. Recently, as we know, we have been all called to join this work of this uh, end-time Philadelphia remnant. Regathering, as we call it popularly. We have been called to be regathered, brethren, because uh, none of us, by ourselves, or by himself or by herself, can indeed uh, be an effective doer of the work of God. So thanks to the Eternal, we have all banded together now in this Philadelphia remnant. However, that's not enough. You know, it's not enough that we just bend together and just listen to the word of God and uh, listen about the good works but not participate in it. And it's not enough if we do not allow God through his spirit to build in us Christ-like character. That's why in this pre-Passover season, I've chosen to remind you of the first and foremost priority and the first and foremost most important work that God is doing today on this earth, which is spreading the good news but the good news also involves, as God says, repent and be converted, you know. Uh, the good news is that, you know, in this meanwhile, uh, we are waiting for the coming kingdom of God. We're not to just sit idle and do nothing. We are to allow God to build in us his character. And his character does involve deep changes, which are sometimes, very often, very painful. And our human nature doesn't want to die. And our human nature doesn't want to change, brethren. Let us not fool ourselves. And you see, because if we don't change, then Satan can play on our human nature and he can lead us into all kinds of deceptions and even apostasy. So uh, we want, of course, to be blessed, don't we? Just James says, you know, be doer of the work 
And this one who does the work will be blessed in what he does. So we want to be blessed and we just need to do what God has shown us is the right thing. Now let's look at a wonderful example of character in the word of God. It's in Daniel chapter 3. I'm sure we all know the story. The story of the three young men that were in Babylonian captivity. Daniel 3 verse 12. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. I'm not reading the whole story because I'm sure you know it. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Those were their Babylonian names, by the way. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. Because, remember, brethren, an image was set up and everyone was commanded to worship this image. These three young followers of God said, we won't do it. And the next verse, verse 13, Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Then in verse 15, king says, I'm now paraphrasing it, summarizing. He says, I'm going to give you one more chance. When you hear the music play and you, you know, you get down and you worship these gods. And if you don't, we will throw you into the fire furnace. In other words, we'll kill you. Then in verse 16, we read what these three brave young men responded. Shedrach, Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. <laughs> you know, that could have been viewed, I guess, as impertinence, but it was indeed godly confidence. Verse 17, if that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. No compromise, in other words. You do whatever you want to do to us, but our God, you know, our God in his word is our priority. Our God's word comes above that of yours. We know what God's word is. We have chosen to do the right thing and we will follow through. And if that means that you throw us into the fire furnace, so be it. So they were thrown into the fire furnace, brethren. And as you remember the story, God protected them, of course. Now, Mr. Armstrong, Herbert, late Herbert Armstrong, in his book, Mystery of the Ages, he posed a vital question to all of us, which is relevant even to our time. And here's the quote from his book. But what do we mean by righteous character? Perfect, holy and righteous character is the ability in such separate entity to come to discern the true way from the false. In other words, to know what is right and wrong. To make voluntarily a full and unconditional surrender to God and his perfect way. To yield, to be conquered by God, to determine even against temptation or self-desire to live and do the right. End of the quote. So we know what is right. We choose to do what is right against temptation and self-desire. Now the question is, how easy is that? Well, it is, we all know, brethren, very, very difficult. You know, against temptation, against self-desire. Now, Shendrach, Meshach, and Abednego could have said, well, we really want to live, so we'll just touch our knees to the floor very quickly, and he'll be happy, and you know, but they knew better. They, what, what was better? Well, they knew that, you know, they knew how to determine even against temptation or self-desire to live and do the right. And even then, such holy character, continues Mr. Armstrong and says, even then, such holy character is the gift of God. It comes by yielding to God to instill his law his right way of life in our minds, within the entity who so decides and wills. End of the quote. And then going on, here is another part of that text in his Mystery of the Ages book. There have been various editions, so I'm not, I didn't give you the, uh, the, 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 the page number, but it doesn't really matter. You can find it anyway online. On offline, you'll find this text. So it says, Mr. Armstrong says, actually, this perfect character comes only from God as instilled within the entity of his creation upon voluntary acquiescence, even after severe trial and test. End of the quote. Acquiescing you know, to God and his way, saying, no, I don't want my way, God, I want your way. That is not easy, brethren, but that is what we have to do even after severe trials and tests. And yes, you don't have to tell me that we have failed numerous times, myself included, also how many times I feel that I failed, after severe trials and tests. 
Nevertheless, we still have to be choosing the right way, determining what is right, what is wrong, and following that what is right without compromise. And yes, I know some of us have gone through severe trials and tests. Some of you are going through some very difficult things. But you know, you realize God's way is God's way and it is right. He knows best and I'll go God's way. God can create anything, brethren, anything except sons and daughters with character. Because he has decided that he won't do that. He won't just create character. Character has to be developed. And again, we have to allow it to be developed. Are we going to enable God to make us his children? That's the question, brethren. Very important for us to be asked ourselves as we examine ourselves in this uh, in this pre-Passover season. Because again, I hope that you get it, God is not going to just create character in us. Sometimes through all those trials and tests, yes, the character is developed. But the character has to be developed. That's the way how God ordered it. And are we going to enable God to make us his children or not? That's our choice. We should certainly see the need, of course, to those godly characteristics to see what is right, to choose to do what is right, and to actually do it. Yet, will we grow in character? Will we grow in character? First Samuel chapter 16 in 1 Samuel chapter 16, God speaks to Samuel as he directs Samuel to choose the next king of Israel. 1 Samuel 16 verse 7, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And that's exactly what we have been Allowing and asking God to show us our hearts and our minds and our true intentions and emotions and, 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 and wrong ways that we have, brethren, before we take the Passover. Otherwise, we'll take the Passover in an unworthy manner, which means that we'll take it to our own judgment. And then we cannot expect any blessings in our lives, you know. God is indeed able to look into our hearts and into our minds and to see what is happening. We may from time to time fool others. We may even fool ourselves. And that happens probably more often than we would like to think. But we will never fool God. Because he knows what we are thinking. That's why it is important to get in step with God's way. Now what what does it mean for us personally to grow in character, to have God's character? Well first and foremost, if we want to build godly character, we have to follow the perfect example that God has given to us, that of our elder brother Jesus Christ. And brethren, it grieves me. Uh, I'm always sharing with you my concerns out of love, out of my desire that we all make it to the end. It really grieves me that in many of our discussions, be written or, or even oral discussions, we sometimes have all kinds of topic, or an array of topics, but we very rarely, I can't remember, there are two topics that people just uh, avoid, and <laughs> not us this much, but you know, fasting sometimes is a topic to be avoided. You'll see in various, in, 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 in the broader church of God, the topic was always kind of, oh, well, you know, not, not very desirable. And the second topic that is, uh, never even mentioned, I can't remember, is how do we emulate Jesus Christ in our given uh, situations, in our given life situations. And the need to emulate Jesus Christ, when I was before, when I was counseled for baptism, that was something that was being, you know, very emphasized. So, God has given to us, you know, the perfect example, that of our elder brother, Jesus Christ, because we are his co-heirs, we are all his, uh, we are all his brethren, brothers and sisters in making, and then when he comes, we'll be born into the family of God, and he'll, you know, but in, even now, we are now uh, begotten, spirit begotten children, we're still children of God, but spirit begotten, not born again yet, and therefore, because we're begotten, he's our elder brother. And in Ephesians chapter 5, Verse 2, it says, And walk in love, as Christ also has loved us, and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. That seems to be a topic that we somehow just go around, and uh, very rarely I've heard people speak about, or I have never heard we either them speak about, how do we emulate Jesus Christ in our personal life? That's another reason why I've chosen to address this topic with you. To address it also on... Uh, let's say, uh, a personal kind of level. In a minute, I'll get into that. Because we need to have that constantly on our mind, brethren. 
Because our self desire, Mr. Armstrong didn't write, about, you know, in vain about self desire. Our self desire is not to emulate Jesus Christ. Our self desire is to live as the world lives. You see, our human mind, brethren, is uh, tuned in to Satan's wavelength. Because Satan keeps broadcasting all the time. Horrible things, horrible thoughts, horrible events, you know. And the whole world just plays the same. And with some people, it's like watching TV, you know. Some people watch TV very quietly, you know. The, the sound is quite, kind of quiet. And, 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 you know, they just watch the program, whatever is on TV. Well, exactly. Our old minds, since our birth, until we are being called, basically, are tuned to that Satan's wavelength. Now, of course, uh, the stronger demonic influence in people's lives is the stronger the sound of the TV. You know, in some homes, the TV is like blasting, you know, blasting a sound is there. It shows you. It, it, it's just a, an illustration of how human mind can be possessed by evil and dominated by evil forces, brethren. And we have to be aware of that because we have been born, you know, into this world. We were deceived at one point, brethren. We were deceived, we were not called. We also were tuned into Satan's wavelength, but even to this day, our human nature wants to be tuned into Satan's wavelength. He doesn't want to emulate Jesus Christ. He doesn't want to think about the sufferings of Jesus that he underwent because of us. So we have to, we need to, well, we don't have to, but we need to, really, uh, because we have free moral will, again, we need to constantly be reminded, you know, uh, of the price that was paid for our freedom in Christ, for our liberty in Christ, for our peace that we have, and our uh, and the uh, reconciliation that that sacrifice allowed us to have with God. So you see, what we read in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2, that's what God and His Son, Jesus Christ, did. Christ offered Himself. That was the plan that they developed, and Jesus Christ offered Himself because He was not guilty. We were the guilty ones, but He offered to die in our stead. That's the example that he set. And then speaking of that example in Colossians chapter 2, we read in verses 6 and 7 that we have received Christ the Lord, that we need to walk in him. That's verse 6. So that means that we need to imitate him, that we need to act like he acted. But we need to assume those godly characteristics that he demonstrated. Why is that topic seems to never come up in our conversations? You know, when we when we communicate and try to encourage one another, brethren. Let's think about it. Let's bring up this subject. What would Christ do in a given situation? How would he react? Or perhaps even a better question for us. Would we do certain things that we do in secret if Christ was in the room? <laughs> verse 7, Colossians 2, verse 7. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught. So you see, these things... These are things that we don't make up on our own. God teaches us these things. And that is why it is important, brethren, to be regathered as a Philadelphian remnant. That's why it is important to have a church community. That's why it is important to have these Skype Skype uh, uh, messages, if you wish. Because time is running, brethren. It's time is short. God teaches us these things. That's why it's important to have the church and have a ministry so that these things can be taught. That was why it was important to have a wonderful leader like we had Richard Close, you know, who would be always exhorting us to love one another, forgive one another, uh, 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 relent in certain things and so on and so forth. We heard today in Serbia, we, we listened to one of his messages about loving your neighbor, your neighbor and your brother. That was what Dr. Thiel delivered on behalf of Richard Close. There's another message that our Richard Close has left. Uh, as well for for a legacy and i plan to deliver that one perhaps after the passover or, or in between but you know brethren that's why that is why important you know god teaches us these things that's why he formed the government of god in his church that the government of god can teach regathered in our case regathered philadelphians uh, 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 those things and today those things can be taught and in verse 7 it says abounding in it with thanksgiving brethren are we abounding in these things and are we doing that in thanksgiving you see we need to follow the example of our elder brother jesus christ and we need to be established in the faith which means firmly grounded feet on the ground balanced i would say knowing what is right and going forward there is so much lunatism in, in the religious world that we were reminded today as we discussed and fellowship in serbian 
You see, some of our siblings, uh, of our members, when, when those members declare that they are now religious, they'll follow the Bible, some of those, some of those siblings were just, uh, totally upset because they've seen, they've seen so much madness in, 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 in the religious world, including those who come up on our local televisions and they kind of mention the Bible, but they have all kinds of ideas which are just crazy. One of those TV, TV uh, personnel, now he's founding a party. He wants to install the theocracy in Serbia. Could you believe that? Another false gospel, brethren. Now, there's much madness in your in your world when it comes to religion. And, uh, you know, when they say religious people, it's always usually a synonym for madness and all kinds of crazy things. That's why we need to be balanced, brethren. That's why we need to have our feet on the ground. We need to know what is right and going forward. That is being established in the faith. Everything that we do should be done following the footsteps of Jesus Christ. We need to keep that in mind. And uh, that is our foundation. That is our starting point. But in all honesty, brethren, how often do we think of this? How often do we think of this? How often do we consider in our discussions the example of Jesus Christ? He should come to the point in our lives where we think about it several times during a day. At least several times. But what if that's not the case? What if that seldom comes to your mind? As it almost never it comes to our conversations. Well, we need to then ask ourselves, brethren, how serious are we about really going God's way? How important is God's law to us? Do we truly see what God is doing with us? Do we understand that? Are we striving to attain to the standards which God sets for us. In other words, do we genuinely desire to develop the character of God in our lives? You know, if theoretically, if we were put on trial and being accused of being a person of character, would there be enough evidence to convict us? To be a character certainly is our good intentions. No wonder... So... It's our good intentions again. But intentions are not enough. To be a character certainly is our good intentions, yet we all need to look at ourselves honestly and critically, brethren. And it seems to me that there are certain believers who would just do anything but, you know, honestly and critically look at themselves. We need to be faced with the honest answers to these, to these questions. In my own case... I feel that currently neither God nor I myself are pleased with the answers, to be honest with you, brethren. That simply means that I have a lot of work to do. We do have to look at ourselves and not just coast along and say, oh, well, I've been in the church this long. Oh, I'm part of the Philadelphia remnant. Well, I come to Sabbath services every week. I'm just fine. No, brethren, we have to ask ourselves, as we do every year before the Passover, am I just fine? How fine am I? Am I striving to develop character in my life with God's help? Because we cannot do that without God's help. You know, that is foundational. But how often do I think about that during the day? Do I think about, oh, well, let's see, I've got a choice to make here. Oh, if I want to do the right thing, the biblical principle would be, or the God the principle would be, and I knew to do, need to do this. Am I going to do it? I need to do it because I need to develop character. You see, Herbert Armstrong said, against severe trials and adversities in our lives. We need to ask ourselves these difficult questions, questions that you probably ask yourselves hundreds of times, certainly around Passover time. Because, you know, why do we have Passover once a year, brethren? Why do we have all the holidays once a year? Well, because, you know, and I know, and we all know that God knows that we need to be reminded of some of these questions. So we have a realization that God the character needs to be developed. And we want to work on that, certainly. Now, given that as the framework upon which to build, let us look at some now practical human life points. Practical human life points, yes. I always love to make things as simple as possible. And I hope that, in spite of my imperfect English, I get the message across. So, uh, practical human life points. When we are talking about building character, the first thing to have in mind... And I'll be listing 12 of those because of the 12 apostles and uh, 12 uh, tribes of Israel. Yes, number 12 is very dear to me. So uh, the first and foremost thing that comes to my mind and we need to have in mind is, brethren, number one is pay attention and strive to do everything, even the little things, right. 
Because everything that we do is important. What is our attitude as we are doing whatever we are doing? You know, it takes a long time to build character. In fact, if you want me to tell you, uh, and from the, if <laughs> Richard Close was among us, if you would ask him how long does it take to build a character, Richard would probably say, it takes approximately a lifetime. And yes, that's the case. It is a slow process. You know, we have to build character one stone at a time. And that is the way that it works. One sad thing is that it takes a long time to build it, but sometimes if we let ourselves go, we can destroy a whole lot of character in a very short period of time. That is why we need to keep close to God and ask God to help us and keep us close to Him and keep His Word and His way of life in the forefront of our minds and keep on the journey of building character. Let's go to Matthew 25 because there is the parable of the talents. Again, I'll not be reading the whole story because you know it, but I'll be reading the most important parts, the highlights. Let us see several highlights in that parable. Matthew 25 verse 14. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Let's drop to verse 20. And he who had received the five talents came forward bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. As I said, brethren, we need to do whatever we do, even little things right. And I think every one of us could say that God has given us a little and he is allowing us to work with that little. So what are we doing? Is it developing? Is it growing? Verse 29. For to everyone who has, who has, will more be given, and he who, uh, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. In other words, one who has not produced with the little bit that he or she was given. So, has not produced anything, you know. Verse 30, And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And if we just let it ride and say, Well, character is important, but that is for another time. I'm busy, I'm working two jobs, I don't have time to study, I don't have time to pray, I don't have time to deal with, you know, my family. Character is just, you know, going to have to go on on the back burner for a while. If we go this route or route, it will not work and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, brethren. But if we develop character with that little bit of knowledge that we have been given, if we apply that knowledge, choose that which is right and then we actually do that which is right, well, we grow in character, you see. And then we can show that we have produced something in our lives, once again, with God's help. Because God gives every one of us a certain amount to work with and expects us to develop that character. So here is personal level point talking about how we can develop character. Here is another point which will indeed surprise you. And the second point is do not do everything that is legal. <laughs> that may sound a bit strange, right? Do not do everything that is legal because do not assume that simply because a particular action is not condemned in the Bible that it is something that we can do and not suffer negative results because that is not necessarily all the case, at all the case, brethren. God's word is not a listing of right and wrong actions. And I think I've perhaps, whether in the Serbian congregation or even to you, I've often uh, outlined and I've often uh, brought up that point. We don't have a list of do this, do that, just like the Pharisees had in Jesus Christ's time, brethren. We have the principles and we have, we, we were given, we have been given the free will of God, the free will, free moral, moral uh, agency. We have been given that freedom to choose, you know, within the principles to make choices. That's how God works. So we don't have a listing of right and wrong actions. We do have example of what wrong choices can lead us to. But we don't have a list of rules. You know, some people just would like uh, true Christianity to be a list of rules. You know, do this, don't do that. 
And they would like to have a list in every area of their lives. Brethren, it doesn't work that way. We were given choice. Why? To build character. For example, take an alcohol. We don't have a prescription in the Bible, thou should, thou should drink this much or that much. Some people can take more, some people can take less. We were given freedom to see where our limits are and to build character. So if we find it, you know, listed somewhere on the good side, we can do it. If the list is somewhere on the negative side, well, we shouldn't do it. It is not, brethren, it's not just a list. Again, God gives us principles, principles of life, and he helps us then to live by those principles. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we have a very good discussion that the Apostle Paul brings to us. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 23. Paul says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. In other words, there are some things that we could do because it is not blatantly a sin, but maybe we would be hurting someone. Maybe we would not be edifying someone. The question is, do we consider the consequences of our actions? Because sometimes it takes character to think of others first over and above ourselves. And I hope that a wider, wider audience, continued Church of God audience, will listen to this message because it is very applicable, brethren, to us and to some of our actions when we, in the past, perhaps even in the present, have shown that our character is not to think of others first over and above ourselves. To think of others first over and above ourselves, it takes character. The Bible, for example, certainly does not forbid us to speak or to write all kinds of messages. But sometimes we say the wrong things, don't we? Or we write the wrong things, don't we? And when we do that, we cause problems. We can cause problems for ourselves. We can cause problems for others. And I can openly criticize someone for something that they have done wrong and is very clearly wrong. But in doing so, I might be sowing the seeds of discord between myself and that person. I might be ruining that person's reputation. And in a week or two, or maybe last month, that person changed, that person repented, or he or she changed and repented, and that is no longer an issue for God. But you see, we are bringing it up and ruining that person's reputation. Sadly, it did happen in the past. And in one such case was involved our late Richard Close the Deacon, whom I had to even defend against, you know, somebody trying to basically ruin his reputation. Because that person is so... I'm speaking about the church, continued Church of God members, by the way. I'm not speaking about the other churches of God. I'm speaking about us, brethren. It is us who are to be prepared for the Passover, to take it worthily, in a worthy manner. And it's just amazing, you know, when somebody just, you know, brings up some issues which are not even issues and kind of ruining somebody's reputation. That's not something what we, that we want to do. Christ, the one with supreme character, certainly considered us over himself. It would have been legal, lawful, allowed for Christ not to sacrifice himself for us. But brethren, he chose to do so. In Romans chapter 14, there is a long section, 14 to 21. But in Romans 14, it is talking about your brother being grieved by what you eat. (laughs) In Romans 14, verse 20, it says, Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. In other words, in this particular case, you are allowed to eat a particular something, but if you do that, you'll offend your brother. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. And I'll just replace the word food and say, Do not, for the sake of your own vanity, destroy the work of God. And again, I'm not addressing the world, I'm not addressing the wider Church of God community, brethren, I'm speaking about us. All things are lawful, but they're not all expedient, they're not all edifying, they're not all good. Sometimes, when we go ahead and do something that is lawful, but questionable, possibly because of the consequences, it may be because we are looking more at the letter of the law and not the spirit of the law. Because, you know, the spirit of the law says, don't hurt your brother, even if you could do that. But if it is going to hurt him or her, you probably shouldn't do that. You know, some people enjoy living on the edge, so to speak, right up on the edge. 
They go as close to the edge of what is the difference between right and wrong, whatever that is. And I'm not the exception to that, I have to tell you. <laughs> you know, as close to the edge as they can, and then, you know, then later you back up and you think, why do I do that? Why do I need this? God says to avoid sin. So that's not a good practice at all to go as close as you possibly can to the line between right and wrong. But we have all done that, I guess. It's our human nature, you know, it's curious. It wants to be rebellious. Brethren, it doesn't want to die. Your baptism is not the end of the story. Your baptism is the beginning of the spiritual battle. Because, brethren, after baptism, your human nature doesn't want to die. He wants to live. He wants to dominate. He wants to stay tuned in to the wave left of Satan. We need to realize that and we need to constantly battle it. And sometimes you have to take that old man and old woman and basically force it back into the watery grave because he he just wants to resurrect. He just, you know, it it brings its ugly head up and it just wants to dominate your life again. And it's the battle we all have. But it's not good practice to go as close to the edge, living on the edge, you know. Because that serves, though, to illustrate the fact that the negative can sometimes be you know, very, very attractive, oh, indeed. And you are on the edge because you are being attracted to that edge. Attracted not by godly forces, not by God's Holy Spirit, but by satanic forces, Satan himself. So we have to be very careful, and we don't want to be pulled over into the dark side. Now, here is another point that we might want to keep in mind. Point number three, I told you that will be 12. A beautiful number. But point number three, I think uh, you would again draw that principle, and you know that principle is drawn again from Romans 14. If you're in doubt about doing something, you probably just shouldn't do it because there is a reason for your doubt. And you may or may not know what the reason for your doubt is, but it is probably a good idea to give it a miss that time. Now think about it later and figure it out a bit more carefully. Romans 14, of course, verse 22, which says, Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. In other words, once we have learned what God wants us to do, and we do something despite that, you're going to condemn yourself. We we don't want to do that, don't we? Verse 23, But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. So, there is that saying in English, when in doubt, don't. If you can do it in full faith, that it is a right thing to do, within God's law, both spiritually and in the letter of the law, it is perfectly alright. But if you cannot do that, then you should not. Because then, you cannot have faith that you are doing the right thing. And how many times do we have this little voice, under quotation mark, little voice, The one little voice that was speaking to uh, Elijah and other servants of God. That little voice telling us that something is not right. Oh, I just had this feeling that it was not right. Well, generally speaking, brethren, it is a good idea to follow that little voice. If that little voice is based on God's law and God's way of life, then it is a good idea just to back off. Because if we think about it carefully, why would we want to settle for something that is doubtful? Why should we not want to wait and have something that is sure and good? That is the better way, isn't it? Here is another example to another point that is to help us in building character. Point number four, live as though God were in the room with us at all times. You know, are we more concerned with what the people, what people might see us doing or are, 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 are we concerned with what God definitely is seeing uh, in us? Because again, we can fool ourselves, brethren. You know, nobody, oh, nobody saw me. It's okay. Nobody sees me. God, but God knows what we are doing. Ecclesiastes verse 12 gives us a very good advice in uh, chapter 12 verse 13. Tells us about the end of the matter. So in Ecclesiastes we have the most uh, knowledgeable, the wisest person in the world giving us all of his thoughts about wisdom. And the conclusion of the matter, the end of the matter is, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, the end of the matter, all has been been heard. Fear God 
and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. The whole duty of all of us, fear God and keep His commandments. Live as if God were right there at all time, at all times helping us. Oh, it's not a, God is going to get you for that. Yeah, going, going, or, or, or is the, <laughs> the southern accent, he's going to get you. <laughs> he's going to get you. It's not you know, like God is going to get you for that sort of an attitude, brethren. That is not what God is about. God is going to help us do the right thing. But we have to want to do the right things, you know. There was a mock newspaper once published by the church many, many years ago. It was the Worldwide Church of God, of which we are continuation of the real Church of God. I mean, not of the uh, apostate one uh, from 1995 that is an onward, even though the apostasy was already. The seeds of apostasy were sown sometimes in 1991 and 1992 when they were behind the scenes. There were some uh, suggestions that uh, we need to change this, that, and the other. And I never call those things changes, brethren, because that's understatement. Those things that were changed are not changes. They're heresies, plainly heresies. So, anyway, uh, there was that mock newspaper published by the church, and there were several headlines. The headlines like the millennium has begun, agriculture has turned around, and all these wonderful things were happening. Several headlines reflecting this time in the millennium when all people will be following God's way. And there was one story of a personal nature. There were two teenaged young people, a boy and a girl, on a beach. They found themselves in a compromising situation and were just about to get themselves in trouble with the laws of God. And do we not sometimes think, well, as long as nobody sees me doing something wrong, I'm okay. Well, in this particular story, they were kind of thinking along those lines. But God always sees us. In the newspaper article, a son or daughter of God intervened to remind them what the right way was. You know, a son or daughter of God, brethren, it is, it is a spirit being, and that could be one of us in the millennium. It would be one of us because we have learned now what is right and what is wrong. And they were encouraged to walk in the right way of God. So we must be very careful to guard the doors of our minds. But then what happens with our computers if we put garbage in? <laughs> you know, garbage in, garbage out. If you watch some stupid things on TV, well, what can you expect? Garbage in, garbage out. If you read stupidities, what would you expect? Brethren? Garbage in and garbage out. But speaking of computers, because we're all now very much uh, 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 connected with our computers, and without computers we wouldn't be able even to serve God in this way as we are blessed to do so. But if your program or input something into a computer which is incorrect, in other words, garbage in, then you can only expect a wrong answer, which is error, you know, garbage out. And that's why we must be careful about what we allow into our minds. If we allow a great deal of garbage, rubbish into our minds, into our brains, then we will probably only be able to output something which is less than a godly standard. I might be making another statement anyway. But in any case, I, I hope you understand what my point is. You know, brethren, character is what we do when no one else is around. You know, I can get away with this, when nobody's here, nobody's looking. You know, that's our, that's what our brain wants. That's what our deceitful nature wants to tell us. But no, brethren, God is there. Character is what you do when no one else is around. So we really need to live as if God were present at all times, because He is. Which brings me to point number five, which is do not simply follow the crowd. In Romans chapter 12 verse 2, we know very well, I think even by heart, that it says, Do not be confirmed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Brethren, the majority of people simply do what everyone else does. The majority just follows the crowd. A dead fish can sort of float downstream with everything. It takes a live fish to swim against the current. In our spiritual lives, we have to put forth effort and swim against the currents of this world. And we are reminded of this at this time of the year, exactly as we are preparing for the most solemn occasion of our lives. In Exodus chapter 23, verse 2, we have this instruction not to follow the crowd. Exodus 23, verse 2. You shall not fall in with the many to do evil, nor shall you bear witness in a lawsuit siding with the many so as to pervert justice. You know, going along with the crowd, doing everything else that everyone else is doing. 
that can get us into a great deal of trouble. In the early church, those who simply followed the majority of what people were doing, eventually would have ended up being good Protestants or Catholics. You know, it was not easy to be in God's church, brethren. <laughs> and eventually, had one followed the crowd, one would not be, one would not have been in God's church. In Revelation chapter 2 verse 20, I'm sure you well remember Jesus' words to the Thyatira church, Revelation 2.20. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Well, what do we see all around us in our so-called Christian societies? Not a whole lot of food sacrificed to idols, but sexual immorality. The world is saying, oh, just do it. If it feels good, do it. So do we just do it because everybody else is doing it? Verse 21, I gave her time to repent. Verse 22, behold, I'll throw her onto a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her, I'll throw into great tribulation. Is that what we want? No, that's absolutely not what we want, brethren. We cannot follow the crowd and do what everyone else does. Point number six is another point. Again, this is all practical things on the practical level, brethren. It's, there is nothing uh, abstract about this. Point six, halfway through to the twelve, to build character, tackle tough assignments first. <laughs> oh. oh, we all know very well what procrastination is. But you see, it's often a good idea to do the difficult parts of any task at the beginning of your work. Because if we get into the habit of putting the hard things off until later, what happens? We will eventually find ourselves not doing them. And when I say tackle t the tough assignments first, brethren, I'm thinking particularly about prayer and Bible study. Oh, is that shocking to you? Well, why should it be shocking? It's not really hard to pray and it's not hard to study, but sometimes, brethren, it is. It is, because we've got other things to do. We've got emergencies. We have got to get to work and, oh, oh, I know I should have, you know, I should have gotten up a half an hour earlier so I could have done some Bible study or done some prayer that was necessary. But, oh, I just overslept or whatever. You know, then we are running throughout the day and, oh, oh, I don't have time anymore to do that. And does it get done later? Sometimes it will, but in the majority of cases, probably it will not. So I'm not saying that it is a must to pray and study in the morning before we go to work. It is a good way to do it. But some people just can pray and study on, you know, their lunch hour. Yes, that's understandable. Or they can do that after they get home. And that is also fine. Whatever works for you. But the important thing is that we don't put it off. Because if we do, we probably won't do it. You know, pray and study early on if you can. Make that a priority. You know, it's a lot harder to pray and study than it is to watch television. It's easy just, you know, to just sit down on the couch or the easy chair and turn the TV on, you know. There is one lovely poem that I remember, I read it in 1999, during the bombing and missed the bombing of Serbia by NATO forces and uh, they lay on the table side by side, good old Bible and a TV guide. <laughs> one is well read and, and one is well preserved, I think, and, and, and cherished with pride. No, not the Bible, but the TV guide and so on. And then the point goes on with the point is, you know, uh, the truth is not found on TV, but in the Bible, not on TV. So anyway, but it's much easier you know, just, you know, turn your TV on and here it is. It's just easy to sit down on the couch, you know, turn the tele, as they say it in Spanish, tele, you know, television. So tele, sometimes we need to do the hardest things first. And speaking of not putting the important things off, here is another principle, the meaning character, principle number seven, but it started today. Don't wait. Hebrews 3. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6 through 8 says, But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. Don't harden your hearts and say, no, 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 I don't want that. I can't take that. I don't want to do that. Brethren, have a soft heart. Do what is necessary today. Today. Verse 12. 
Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. And this is a real possibility, brethren, for all of us, to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day. That's why exhortation, brethren, is there. That we will not just be following strange ideas, ungodly ideas, unbiblical ideas, and just eventually fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear this voice, his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. You know, exhort one another every day as long as it is called today. Today is the chance we have in our lives. Tomorrow is not yet here. Yesterday is gone. We did a good job. We didn't do a good job. Well, it's gone. We need to make sure that we are doing something right now and doing it positively. And we need to start today. And as we do, we are, this is the eighth point, always striving for excellence, especially in the spiritual realm. Because that is primarily what we are concerned with. Spiritual realm, as we are said, we are told in Philippians chapter 1 and in verse 9. The Apostle Paul says, Philippians 1 and 9, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. I have already underlined, brethren, discernment, the need for discernment. There is an urgent need in the continuing church of God of discernment. We need to learn to discern spirits. We need to learn to discern attitudes. We need to learn to discern when Satan is trying to subvert us, use us for his purpose, brethren. We need discernment. So that you may approve what is excellent. Do we know what is excellent? Are we striving for what is excellent? There is no concept of striving for excellency in today's world. It will be harder to do that, but it will take more time. But there is no substitute for excellence. I'm speaking primarily in the spiritual realm. That means there is no substitute for studying God's word. There is no substitute for praying. There is no substitute for meditating. If we say, oh, I'm just not going to do that, then we're not drinking in of God's word. We're not thinking about God's word. We're not asking God to help us to understand more about his way of life. If we read about the materials that God wanted to use for the construction of the tabernacle, you know, we'll see that he loves quality materials. And more importantly, God loves to see quality in our lives. That is what we need to strive for, to be men and women of excellence. You know, we're talking about how we can, bit by bit, here and there, on a personal day-to-day level, grow in character. And here is another point, brethren, that I want all of us to take to heart because this has been sorely lacking in the continuing Church of God members' character. Yes, this is generalization perhaps, but I just don't want to name names. I just want to make us a good point for us to understand because we can all fall into those kinds of uh, pitfalls. And point nine is respond properly to correction. Oh, when I said correction, uh, what do you feel? What is there? Immediate, oh no, correction. Resistance. Because sadly, in the Church of God history, we have learned that correction means something awful. It means a minister kind of grilling you. And, and, and it means that, you know, that's, that, that's the wrong constant brethren of, of correction. And I know many people have been abused and, 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 and misused. The correction has been misused by various ministry. Brethren, you have to realize one thing. In the 20th century, there were plenty of false ministers, false brethren, false believers who crept into the church of God and made a whole havoc and mess. But brethren, the fact that they have crept into the church of God does not mean that the government of God and the correction that comes from the government of God is something terrible, something awful, something satanic and something that is going to hurt anyone. Please, let's get that out of our minds. Because our nature... By nature, we do not want to be corrected, do we? Oh, we don't. Come on, be honest with yourself. We want people to say, oh, there, there, there. You are such a wonderful person and you have done such a wonderful job and everybody loves you and all is good and right. That is what we want to hear, but that is not always the case. Sometimes we do things that are wrong, brethren. 
And please accept it. We are all wrong at times. If we are not wrong, then what's the purpose of Jesus Christ's sacrifice for us? Sometimes we do things that are wrong, and sometimes we need to be corrected for that. And God is very good at correcting us, you know. And God can use a wide variety of people, places and things to correct us. But the question is, we're speaking about building character, godly character. Brethren, are we open to that and do we take it to the heart? Are we? And sadly, I've seen that in our own ranks, brethren, I'm speaking about us. Resistance to a goodwill uh, advices that I've given to people and others have given to people, Mr. Close, for example, like Mr. Close and, and, and Bob Thiel, resistance to change and be corrected. And it is my, my sad assessment that there, is, there are individuals who believe that by associating with the right person, Dr. Bob Thiel, that is, that by being part of a, of a Philadelphia remnant, that is the continuing church of God, that they've secured themselves, they've secured their salvation, and they've also secured themselves uh, 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 to be in the place of safety. Oh no, brethren. And what a horrible thing it would be when they wake up one day and they wake up amidst the great tribulation and wonder why. Well, that's why. I'm telling you now why. Why? Because we have to allow, because we're not perfect, we do things that are wrong and we need to be, uh, we need to allow God to correct us. And we need to have open, you know, to take it to heart. And it's very dangerous thing to believe that if you're associated with the right people, that you're gathered in the right place and not changing in your character that you're going to you know, have secure salvation and secure place of safety. I'm afraid, brethren, that's my impression, God willing that I'm wrong, but it's my impression that there are sadly a core of believers, core of individuals among us who believe that that's the case. No, 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 that's not the case. A very basic principle that we would rather not think about but it is in the Bible for us, Hebrews 12, verse 6. Hebrews 12, verse 6. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son or daughter whom he receives. Now think about it logically, brethren. If we are never being chastised, that either means that God doesn't love us or it means we are not looking for that. And in, in our midst... I've seen the second thing, the last thing, we're not looking for that. Because our nature tells us we'll be ashamed if we are corrected and it's shame for my ego. It's shame. Brethren, there's nothing shameful about it in God's eyes. God has just told us that He doesn't love us if He doesn't correct us. But we are not ready to be corrected. We are not showing God, you know, if we don't want to allow for that, we're not ready. We are not showing we're not showing God that we want to change because He will help us. You know, to be spiritual sons and daughters, brethren, we, we have to be able to accept correction. Of course, it's always given in love, the true correction. But there is something that was always sort of lacking in the church of God, brethren. Three things that you know. Hope, faith, and more of all, love. And why was it lacking? Because people were not open-hearted, to changes and correction. They did not allow God to change them. I'm speaking about the ministry as well. Don't don't think that I'm speaking about the lay members only. No, I'm speaking about the whole ministry. Brethren, some of us have been terribly abused by the government, so-called government of God. That was the reason why, for a long time, a longer time, I did not gather, regather with the continuing church of God because I was afraid of the teaching says hierarchical government. That was the alarm to me. Oh no, I'm like, oh no, there's somebody, there's a dictator who's going to abuse me. That has not not been the case in the Canadian Church of God. You name me, where is the dictator in the Canadian Church of God? Tell me, where is he? The late Richard Close was one of the most loving persons I have ever met in my life. Dr. Thiel is one of the most open-minded and, 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 and cooperative person I've met in my life. And even when he corrects me, he always does it out of love. And it's never an unpleasant situation. He always points out why it is wrong, and then you think, oh yes, that's wrong, well, okay. 
he sees it, so I'm like, okay, you have to change here, Sasha, this is wrong, you know, he, the man is right, you know, you don't, you haven't seen at the time that this was wrong, this was a wrong statement, this was a wrong action, this was an extreme statement, you know, get rid of it. Brethren, Lord disciplines those whom he loves. And again, I have to point this out because this, we are in the pre passover examination. And again, I, I, I'm afraid that many who have affiliated with the continuing church of God are so immature spiritually because they would rather never be corrected and thus they are not sons and daughters of God. Or they are disqualifying Perhaps that's better to put it. They're disqualifying from becoming the sons and daughters of God. The abuses, brethren, of the government of God is the matter of past, as far as we are concerned. Nobody's going to abuse you, coerce you, uh, grill you, make you publicly ashamed. No, brethren, that's, that's, that was the case in the past. With some people, that's not the case for the present. We are a Philadelphia remnant. And we are well aware of what those abuses can cause in people, and I'm afraid myself first to do anything that would be that would be uh, tyrannical, if you want, and contrary to God's word. But there are things that you just have to react to. When I see a heresy, brethren, I have to say that's a heresy. When I see that there is a going wrong way, I have to say, well, this is the wrong way. Hey, uh, the Bible says something else. When people even twist the Bible. Quoting the Bible just to justify their own uh, ideas. Sometimes I have to say, no, 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 look, the Bible says something else here in this other part of the Bible. So we cannot twist it. We brethren, we need to be people of balanced mind. But again, I'm, I'm so afraid that there is a, and I'm, a, I'm just so afraid that there's so, I don't know how many, but there are individuals, let's put it that way, who believe, oh, I'm in the right place, oh, I'm associated with the right church, great, wonderful, I'm my place in the place of safety is secured, and my salvation is secured. But in the meantime, those people just make accusations against the other church members, those people make subtle accusations, open accusations, they uh, ruin somebody's character, and so on and so forth. I, if they think that they will be in the place of safety, oh no. The place of safety, Mr. Armstrong used to say, would be the last training. How could any of us be in the last training if we don't have the previous training leading up to the last training, you see? We're to be trained now, brethren. And to be spiritual sons and daughters, we have to be able to see, receive and accept correction. But you know, I have to tell you, I'm speaking again about us. I'm not speaking about the world. I'm not speaking about other churches of God, which, you know, there is a place to speak about it as well. But I'm speaking about us. We are preparing for the Passover to take it worldly. It amazes me, brethren. It amazes me to what degree of self-righteousness some people have gone in our fellowship in order to avoid correction and to continue to live in self-deception that they are so great, so righteous, and so wonderful. And the consequences of, self, of such self-deception are so horrible because we know from the Bible that the Laodiceans actually live in a self Deception. They think they are so righteous and great in God's eyes, and yet, remember, God, Christ tells them, it's all the opposite. So I hope that we'll be given some time to think about this and get rid of this, and get rid of that fear of being corrected. We all need correction at times, brethren. Everyone. Even Dr. Bob Thiel, he's so humble to tell me, look, I've written this about this and that. You know, take a look at it and tell me and, and give me some correction. Well, he doesn't just say correction, but give me something that I've missed so that I can just include it. So we all need correction. Even he, so he, the leader, the man that God has chosen for our end time to lead the Philadelphia, a Philadelphia remnant, even he is aware of the fact that he needs sometimes, you know, correction or input from others. Because in many counselors there is wisdom. So we all know that need that. And please just get, if you have fear of correcting, being corrected because of whatever, just get rid of that fear, please. Because perfect love casts out all fear. If we are Philadelphia remnant, we are to have, supposed to have perfect love, right? Because what is Philadelphia? Love for the brethren. If we have the perfect love, then we have to cast out all the fear. We have to be with, our, with one another. We have to be fearless in a good sense. Supporting one another, encouraging one another, but also 
correcting one another. How many times have you seen, I'll just give you, how many times have you seen, uh, uh, it would be usually from Canada, that, that there comes a correction. I say something wrong or I give it wrong and there comes, very quickly comes a correction from Canada. Remember, we, you know, from which person saying, look, what the Bible says this, the Bible, oh yeah, she's right. And have, has that person never experienced any unpleasant things because she said, well, look, but the, you know, you have forgotten this part of the Bible. No, she didn't. Because she's right. And because I know that I'm not perfect and you all should know that you're not perfect and we all sometimes need correction. So please get rid of that fear of correction, brethren. That's point number nine. Because the fear of correction and the fear is going to stifle our spiritual growth. We must realize that we are not perfect. Each one of us. If we were perfect, what's the purpose of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ then? But also that, you know, we need to realize that God really, really wants to help us to learn. And one of the ways that He helps us to learn is by correcting us. You know, if you... If you're piloting an airplane and you are off course, you desperately want correction. You want to be corrected and brought back into the right course, right? We need to be that way too. Correction is not a bad thing, brethren. Correction helps us to get back onto the right course. And as we pilot our lives being corrected by God, we are 2.10, persevere in doing right. Proverbs 24 verse 10. Proverbs 24, verse 10. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. There will be adversity. We are at a time now in the history of humankind when things will begin getting very difficult in the end time. And how do we react to that? If we remove any chance there is to fail, we remove the chance to build character. So we will fail in adversity and we need to persevere in doing the right thing. We have studied, we know what is right. Once again, there will be need for us to choose that which is right and then we need to actually do it. And in doing so, Hebrews chapter 12, in doing so we are, what are we to consider? Hebrews 12 verse 3. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In other words, look at look to our brother, brother Jesus Christ. So what he went through, you know, see what he went through. Take from his example. Learn from that. Verse 4. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. We haven't, brother. Jesus Christ did. Verse 5. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? You see, Jesus Christ shed his blood for us, not that he sinned, he did not. But the exhortation was, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. I've already mentioned that we need to get rid of that rid of, of fear of correction. So if we have done something wrong, if we have got off course and are corrected, and we are open to seeing that correction, brethren, we go back and do what is right. Learn a lesson from that and choose, once again, to do what is right and to do it. Persevere in doing right. And also, point 11, be consistent in doing what is right. Don't be one way at home and another way at services. Oh, there were terrible examples in our past. How hypocritical people can be. Oh, they're also well attired and, you know, great attired. They're wonderful at service. And you think, oh, what a great example of a godly family. But boy, oh boy. At home, a totally different story. We need to be consistent in doing what is right and consistently going, going the right way. You cannot have one face for the church services and the other face for, I don't know, your work, your family, or whatever. So it's not just going the right way when we are at services. That's easy to do. Oh, trust me, it is. And then when we get home, we stop. You know, That's not the way we should be at all. James chapter 1. And in verse 6, James 1, 6. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And that is why it is important to be consistent. Not double-minded, not, oh, I've got, you know, oh, I've got this secret life over here. 
No, I act this way when I'm in that environment. And then when I'm at church service, I act this way. I am double 16 minded, whatever God says. Such a person is unstable in all his ways. Let's look at the example of Elijah in First Kings chapter 18. If you cannot follow quickly the, the, the scriptures, just jot them down and you can check them later. First Kings 18.21 and Elijah came unto all the people and said, he is now addressing the house of Israel in the Old Testament, and said, How long hold you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. In other words, choose. You know what is right. I said before you life and death, choose life, God says. But don't hold between two opinions. Isaiah chapter 29 verse 13. We're talking about being consistent in our following of God's way. Isaiah chapter 29 verse 13. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as these people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips to do honor me, but have removed their heart from far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Brethren, it cannot be that way. It should not be that way. If we find ourselves being this way, we need to change. We need to go on our knees before God. We need to repent and we need to ask God to help us to change because sometimes we have the best of intentions. You know, we say or we think, oh, I really want to do that. But what do we do? God was saying here that is the way the house of Israel was. They say, oh, they said they wanted to follow me, but they didn't do it. They were not consistent. And the final point, you see, in building a Christ-like character, brethren, is look past the present. The hope that we have has to be a con concrete hope. It has to be something important in our lives. We have to want that. We have to want to go God's way. Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, and this is the way uh, Paul looked at it. Romans 8 verse 18 Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us in a future time. Now, can we follow Paul's example in that regard? Satan will be trying everything to get us to give up, brethren, to get us to get our eyes off of God's kingdom. He has already succeeded with some who are among us, but we're obviously not of us, brethren. That should shake us. Well, it is my sincere hope that we would be shaken by that fact. There were those who were among us, but not of us. Not, not, you know, not of us. It should shake us to the point that we'd be thinking, wait, I could be the next one deceived by Satan, to the point that I fall away. Because no one is immune to Satan's lures and schemes, no matter what rank he might be having in the church, rather than be it a lay member, be it an evangelist, a deacon, an elder, the history of the Church of God of the last century proved that. Nobody is immune. Because I said to you, our, our, our minds naturally, our natural minds are tuned into Satan's wavelength. And we constantly, constantly have to fight off, uh, uh, off the uh, signal that comes from Satan into our minds, you know. Do this, do that. Oh no, don't, don't suffer. Don't worry about God. Nobody sees you do it. Oh, worry about, oh, look, you're being attacked. You know, uh, uh, use your vanity to uh, show them how intelligent you are, how greater you are. Oh, keep your weapons, you know, you will need it. Uh, and so on and so on and so on, brethren, and so on. Oh, in the latest cases, oh, you're a prophet. Oh, it's not only Bob Thiel, it's you as well. You're a prophet. You must be right. You're using the right sources. When the sources are all completely upside down and totally uh, uh, sources that you cannot rely on. That was the latest case we have. Oh, you're a prophet, you know. You're also a prophet, you know. Just, uh, just go the way that I tell you. How sad, brethren. It can happen to all of us. No one is immune to Satan's lures and schemes, no matter what rank he might be having in the church. And I hope that, again, a, a large number of church members, including those in Africa and Asia, will hear me as well. We seem to forget that the main war that Satan is waging today is against his church, not against the world that he has under his control. 
But again, the last point I mentioned to you, we have to be able to look past the present. Look into the future and see what God has promised us. Look at the hope that he gives us. With all of these things, brethren, we have to realize that we cannot compromise. We need to ask God to help us to set our minds against compromising with godly values, compromising with God's truth. One of the reasons why the continuing church of God was uh, formed was that Dr. Bob Thiel and his wife, and then others who joined, of course, and have been now in the process of regathering, they did not want to compromise with God's truth. Have you ever heard Dr. Thiel compromising with the truth? That was the reason why we didn't want to compromise. So if we truly want to be Philadelphians, then we have to follow his example as he follows the example of Jesus Christ. So what does this process of building holy, righteous character mean for us, brethren? In short, it simply means becoming more Christ-like, becoming more God-like, taking on the characteristics of our elder brother Jesus Christ and God our Father. That's what it means as we strive to copy the character of Jesus Christ. He counts us as his brothers and sisters, and so that is what we need to be striving for. Our goal is to become more and more God-like. If we are to become part of his family, we need to act like members of his family. We need to conduct, conduct our lives and ourselves in a way which demonstrates that we do desire that goal. And once again, if we are on trial for being men and women of character, would there be enough evidence to convict us? In order to act like Jesus Christ, we need to learn to think like Jesus Christ. We need the type of character that Jesus Christ had. As he suffered in order to help us, so we go through things that are not easy, you know, persecutions, afflictions of every stripe, all kinds of lies on the internet floating about us. And sometimes we have to suffer, brethren. We suffer trials, trials of health, all kinds of trials, but you know, they try our character. And these trials, hard though they be, difficult though they be, will help us to grow spiritually. And as we grow spiritually, now, as we grow spiritually, of course, we'll be better able to help others, both now and in the world to come.